Welcome to the first day of Craftlid, our 12-day Christmas story extravaganza. That is just one of my favorite Christmas carols, and I love it particularly when it's a cappella, like this. All of the audio, including what you're listening to right now, we can thank LibriVox for. If you don't know about LibriVox, you can go to L-I-B-R-I-V-O-X dot org and check out all of the free audiobooks that are there, all of them classic and public domain, as well as some music. Or, if you're really feeling excited about it, you can volunteer to read for them as well and share your voice with everyone else who loves great books. Well, for our first day of Craftlit, as I mentioned on episode 476 of the regular Craftlit podcast, I was going to start off with some fun stuff. It's fun. It's sentimental. It's an author I'd never heard of before, but I don't know why I haven't, because he was everywhere for a while. And I'm going to play you two stories from him. His name is John Kendrick Bangs. He was born in 1862. He died in 1922. He was an American author and humorist. He was an editor and a satirist. He went to Columbia University. I think he was born in Yonkers. Uh, Went to Columbia and then wound up working for everything Harper's ever did, Harper's magazines. He worked on a lot of them. And then he went over and started the New Metropolitan Magazine and then eventually Puck, the humor magazine. So this guy definitely got around. In many ways, to me, he sounded like a very mild Mark Twain. He has that sense of humor, but not in a mean way. In fact, I think if you pay attention to how he sets up the very first story, which is called The Child Who Had Everything But, you'll hear it in the way he talks about the ghost who appears. Very Scrooge, very Dickens, but very not Scrooge and Dickens. It's a very different take on that kind of story. And in fact, that is the chunk of the story that has the most archaic slang terms that I wanted to fill you in on before we listen. First, you need to know that uh, before and around the time that John Kendrick Bangs was writing, uh, and this particular set of stories he wrote in 1912, Before and during this time, spiritualism was a big deal. There were lots of people who were having seances at home. They went to spiritualists. They went to mediums. Um, There was a, especially right before the turn of that millennium, there was a big rise in that kind of belief system. And you will hear some of that reflected in the first story we listen to today along with his rather funny commentary on spiritualism and things like that. He also mentions hobble skirts, which if you are not female or haven't looked very closely at costumes in movies or old fashioned magazines, you may not have heard of a hobble skirt before. H-O-B-B-L-E, just like you think it would be. It's something that would hobble a woman and make it harder for her to walk. The way that's accomplished is usually by making the hem of the skirt, the bottom edge of it, a little narrower, more tapered at the bottom than otherwise would be useful. So if you have the hobble skirt and it ends right above the knee, then pretty much the only part of the woman's legs that she can move is her calves. This creates a very goofy looking walk, but if done well, can be, I'm sure, quite something. Personally, I like to be able to move, but that's just me. One of the places that I remember seeing a hobble skirt in popular media was Rizzo's skirt in the first Grease, not the live Grease that was done recently, but the one with John Travolta and Stockard Channing playing Rizzo and Olivia Newton-John playing Sandy. Rizzo's skirt, the classic black pencil skirt, is more or less a hobble skirt. Her knees are very close together in that it is a very tight skirt. Now, if you take that back to like Titanic days, pre-Titanic days, and you think about the kinds of skirts, oh, or or, or My Fair Lady. You see the skirts where they're kind of poofy on top, but then they get really narrow around the ankles. Those are hobble skirts. So that's one of the things he mentions. Then he mentions finger curls. Now, finger curls, there are two different kinds. There are finger waves, and then there are finger curls or spit curls. I've put pictures of everything that I'm talking about up on the Craftlet show notes, So if you go to craftlit.com slash 
12-days-2017, you'll get a list of all of our 12 Days of Craft Lit episodes. And if you want to go to just today's episode, go to craftlit.com slash first dash 2017, F-I-R-S-T dash 2017. And you'll see all the pictures right there. So finger curls, if you think of Veronica Lake or actresses back then who had that ocean wavy kind of waves in their hair, close to their head and very uniform, very neat, those would be finger curls. Then there's a reference to something called a psyche knot. This is P-S-Y-C-H-E. This is a reference to that very iconic neoclassical hairstyle that was supposed to harken back to the Greeks and Eros and Psyche being two characters from Greek mythology. This became known as a Psyche knot. It's like a bun or a chignon uh, that's on the upper back top of the head. Often there are ribbons involved. And I've got a picture of that for you as well at craftlit.com slash first dash 2017. And then there is a not so happy reference to something called a slumming party. Well, knowing that this was written in 1912 and knowing how wealthy people often thought about or treated people who were poor or people who were in, in one way or another disadvantaged, uh, going back to madhouses in the 1800s and earlier, it went on for a long time, where the rich people would go and, and watch the, and I'm using air quotes here, watch the loonies, L-O-O-N-I-E-S. This was an entertainment for these people. Well, slumming parties were not entirely different. They weren't quite that bad, I guess, on a scale of awful to horrifyingly horrid. But the idea is similar. However, I read some histories of slumming parties, and I found that there was an interesting upside to this idea. If you listened to Bleak House with me, you may remember a character named Mrs. Particle. Mrs. Particle was one of those people who thought it was her duty as a Christian to go and help the deserving poor. She would barge into people's homes and maybe do something like bring them some food, some bread, some milk, something like that. But mostly she would just barge into their house so that she could lecture them. And in lecturing them, them of course, she was bringing God to them. She was not the most spectacular missionary <laughs> I've ever seen in literature, and she wasn't supposed to be. This was something that Dickens was really annoyed by. Well, slumming parties were similar. There was a time when it was, let's go see how the other half lives. And then it became a tourist attraction. Let's go see how the other half lives. And oh, if we really have a good time, we'll get caught by the cops in a police raid at a bar or a club or a restaurant. But then some researchers back then did some researching and they found out that young people, teens, 20s-ish people, who participated in these slumming parties wound up being the people who went down and actually helped. So things like there were Christian women's associations and Jewish women's associations that would go into the Lower East Side in New York City and bring mothers uh, sanitary supplies like soap and <laughs> cloths to clean with and scrub brushes and things, things that would cost money, but things that you needed if you wanted your family to be healthy. And they would help them find ways to make a, a clean living environment for their family in these otherwise squalid conditions. These researchers felt that there was a, a certain amount of connection between those who were involved in these slumming parties and those who wound up being actually materially helpful to the, the poor people at the time. You will hear the reference to slumming parties and you will hear it done in both a positive and a disparaging way, depending on which character is speaking. So you'll get an idea of the, the range of attitudes towards these things, even at this time, even in 1912. So this, there are several stories, there are several stories we're going to listen to over the next 12 days that I would file under the more things change, the more things stay the same. 
There's also a reference to agate and aggies. And for those of you who remember back, way back, marbles, playing marbles. There's a whole subculture that goes along with marbles. And I found a really fantastic web page. It's actually a mental floss article that talks about marbles and the history of marble playing and marble slang. So you'll find all about Aggies and Allies and Mibs and all there for you on the show notes. You'll also hear our main character call something a talking machine. And he's just talking about a, a Victrola or, or some kind of turn the crank record player in the corner. In our second story, Santa Claus and Little Billy, You'll hear a reference to sandwich boards. Even if you don't know what those are by name, I am sure you have seen them in a textbook somewhere when the textbook was discussing the Depression. These were boards that you would put over your shoulders. So there'd be two pieces of twine or string that would attach the top of the boards together with a little bit of distance. They wouldn't be super close together because you would need to put the space between the boards over your head so the rope or the twine is hanging on your shoulders and you have a board in the front and a board in the back sandwiching you between the two boards. These boards would then have advertisements painted on them. Or if you were doing this for yourself, it might say the end is nigh or less passion from less fish. That was, that was an actual <laughs> sign. We saw an actual sandwich border in 1987 in Leicester Square in London. And I actually think it may have been less passion from less protein. And then he listed all of the different protein sources and how the Bible would frown <laughs> on you if, you if you ate any protein, that that was actually bringing about the end of the world. Our sandwich board does not talk about anything like that today, but it is nonetheless a sandwich board. And then the last thing that might throw you, as it threw me, and I had to do some digging, You'll hear a reference to going into a telephone station to make a phone call. Well, there's a reason why they're using the phrase telephone station. And that is because in the United States, in 1891, Mr. Gray of the Gray Telephone Pay Station Company began installing phones on posts and in cabinets all across the United States. Those cabinets originally were called pay stations. So there would be a phone book in it, just like if you're old enough, just like when we were little, there would be a phone and you would have to pay into the phone in the pay station in order to make a phone call. So that's all it is. It's, it's like a TARDIS <laughs> for our modern listeners. It's like a TARDIS, but with a phone in it and a paper directory instead of a digital one. So that's all. Some of these things, it's so funny to realize that they just don't exist anymore. And yet I don't feel that old. And yet I clearly am. So time marches on. And that's really all that I have to give you a heads up about before we listen. I'll catch you on the flip side, just to check in. And I hope you enjoy listening to our two stories today. The first, The Child Who Had Everything But, and our second, Santa Claus and Little Billy, both written by John Kendrick Bangs and read for us by David Wales. Here we go. Good King Wenceslas looked out on the feast of Stephen. A Little Book of Christmas by John Kendrick Bangs. Section 2 The Child Who Had Everything But. Part 1. I knew it was coming long before it got there. Every symptom was in sight. I had grown fidgety and sat fearful of something overpoweringly impending. Strange noises filled the house. Things generally, according to their nature, severally creaked, soughed, and moaned. There was a ghost on the way. That was perfectly clear to an expert in uncanny visitations of my wide experience, and I heartily wished it were not. There was a time when I welcomed such visitors with open arms, because there was a decided demand for them in the literary market, 
and I had been able to turn a great variety of spooks into anywhere from three thousand to five thousand words apiece at five cents a word. But now the age had grown too skeptical to swallow ghostly reminiscence with any degree of satisfaction. People had grown tired of hearing about visions, and desired that their tales should reek with the scent of gasoline, quiver with the superfervid fever of tangential loves, and crash with moral thunderbolts aimed against malefactors of great achievement and high social and commercial standing. Wherefore it seemed an egregious waste of time for me to dally with a spook, or with anything else for that matter, that had no strictly utilitarian value to one so professionally pressed as I was, and especially at a moment like that. It was Christmas morning, and the hour was twenty-eight minutes after two, when I was so busy preparing my Ode to June, and trying to work out the details of a midsummer romance in time for the market for such productions early in the coming January. And right in the midst of all this pressure there rose up these beastly symptoms of an impending visitation. At first I strove to fight them off, but as the minutes passed they became so obsessively intrusive that I could not concentrate upon the work at hand, and I resolved to have it over with. "'Oh, well,' said I, striking a few impatient chords upon my typewriting machines, "'if you insist upon coming, come, and let's have done with it.' I roared this out, addressing the dim depths of the adjoining apartment, whence had risen the first dank apprehension of the uncanny something that had come to pester me. This is my busy night, I went on, when nothing happened in response to my summons, and I give you fair warning that, however psychic I may be now, I've got too much to do to stay so much longer. If you're going to haunt, haunt! It was in response to this appeal that the thing first manifested itself to the eye. It took the shape first of a very slight veil of green fog, which shortly began to swirl slowly from the darkness of the other room, through the intervening portieres, into my den. Once within, it increased the vigor of its swirl, until almost before I knew it, there was spinning immediately before my desk something in the nature of a misty maelstrom, buzzing around like a pinwheel in action. "'Very pretty, very pretty indeed,' said I, a trifle sarcastically, refusing to be impressed, but I don't care for pyrotechnics. I suppose, I added flippantly, that you are what might be called a mince pyrotechnic, eh? Whether it was the quality of my jest, or some other inward pang due to its gyratory behavior that caused it, I know not, but as I spoke, a deep groan issued from the center of the whirling mist, and then out of its indeterminateness there was resolved the hazy figure of an angel. Only she was an intensely modern angel. She wore a hobble skirt instead of the usual flowing robes of ladies of the supernal order, and her halo, instead of hovering over her head as used to be the correct manner of wearing these hard-won adornments, had perforce become a mere golden fillet, binding together the great mass of finger-curls and other distinctly yellow capillary attractions that stretched out from the back of her cerebellum for two or three feet, like a monumental psyche-knot. I could hardly restrain a shudder as I realized the theatric quality of the lady's appearance, and I honestly dreaded the possible consequences of her visit. We live in a tolerably censorious age, and I did not care to be seen in the company of such a peroxidized vision as she appeared to be. "'I am afraid, madam,' said I, shrinking back against the wall as she approached, "'I am very much afraid that you have got into the wrong house. 
Mr. Slatherberry, the theatrical manager, lives next door. She paid no attention to this observation, but, holding out a compelling hand, bade me come along with her, her voice having about it all the musical charm of an oboe suffering from bronchitis. "'Not in a year of Sundays, I won't,' I retorted. "'I am a respectable man, a steady churchgoer, a trustee for several philanthropic institutions, and a Sunday-school teacher. I don't wish to be impolite, but really, madam, rich as I am in reputation, I am too poor to be seen in public with you. I am a spirit, she began. I'll take your word for it, I interjected, and I could see that she told the truth, for she was entirely diaphanous, so much so, indeed, that one could perceive the piano in the other room with perfect clarity through her intervening shadiness. It is, however, the unfortunate fact that I have sworn off spirits. Nonetheless, she returned, her eyes flashing and her hand held forth peremptorily, you must come. It is your predestined doom. My next remark I am not wholly clear about, but as I remember it, it sounded something like, I'll be doomed if I do. Whereupon she threatened me. It is useless to resist, she said. If you decline to come voluntarily, I shall hypnotize you and force you to follow me. We have need of you. But, my dear lady, I pleaded, please have some regard for my position. I never did any of you spirits any harm. I've treated every visitor from the spirit land with the most distinguished consideration, and I feel that you owe it to me to be regardful of my good name. Suppose you take a look at yourself in yonder looking-glass, and then say if you think it fair to compel a decent, law-abiding man of domestic inclinations like myself to be seen in public with, well, with such a looking head of hair as that of yours. My visitor laughed heartily. Oh, if that's all, she said amiably, we can arrange matters in a jiffy. Your wife possesses a hooded Macintosh, does she not? I think I saw something of the kind hanging on the hat-rack as I floated in. I will wear that if it will make you feel any easier. It certainly would, said I. But see here, can't you scare up some other cavalier to escort you to the haven of your desires? She fixed a sternly steady eye upon me for a moment. Aren't you the man who wrote the lines, The world's a green and gladsome ball, And love's the ruler of it all, And life's the chance vouchsafed to me For deeds and gifts of sympathy? Didn't you write that? she demanded. I did, madam, said I, And I meant every word of it, But what of it? Is that any reason why I should be seen on a public highway with a lady ghost of your especial kind? Enough of your objections, she retorted firmly. You are the person for whom I have been sent. We have a case needing your immediate attention. The only question is, will you come pleasantly and of your own free will, or must I resort to extreme measures? These words were spoken with such determination that I realized that further resistance was useless, and I yielded. All right, said I. On your way, I'll follow. Good, she cried, her face wreathing with a pleasant little Nile-green smile. Get the Macintosh, and we'll be off. There's no time to lose, she added, as the clock in the tower on the square boomed out the hour of three. What is this, anyhow? I demanded, as I helped her on with the Macintosh, and saw that the hood covered every vestige of that awful coiffure. Another case of Scrooge? Sort of, she replied, as, hooking her arm in mine, she led me forth into the night. Part Two 
We passed over to Fifth Avenue and proceeded uptown at a pace which reminded me of the active gait of my youth. My footsteps had grown unwontedly light, and we covered the first ten blocks in about three minutes. We don't seem to be headed for the slums, I panted. Indeed we are not, she retorted. There is no need of carrying coals to Newcastle on this occasion. This isn't a slum case. It's far more acute than that. A tear came forth from her eye and trickled down over the Mackintosh. It is a peculiarity of modern effort on behalf of suffering humanity, she went on, that it is concentrated upon the relief of the misery of the so-called submerged to the utter neglect of the often more poignant needs of the emerged. We have workers by the thousand in the slums, doing all that can be done, and successfully, too, to relieve the unhappy condition of the poor. But nobody ever seems to think of the sorrows of the starving hundreds on Upper Fifth Avenue. "'See here, madam,' said I, stopping suddenly short under a lamp-post in front of the public library, "'I want to tell you right now that if you think you are going to take me into any of the homes of the hopelessly rich at this hour of the morning, you are the most mightily mistaken creature that ever wore a psyche-knot. Why, great heavens, my dear lady, suppose the owner of the house were to wake up and demand to know what I was doing there at this time of night. What could I say? You have gone on slumming parties, haven't you? she demanded coldly. Often, said I, but that's different. Why? she asked, with a simplicity that baffled me. Is it any worse for you to intrude upon the home of a Fifth Avenue millionaire than it is to go unasked into the small, squalid tenement of some poor sweatshop worker on the east side? Oh, but, but it's different, I protested. I go there to see if there is anything I can do to relieve the unhappy condition of the persons who live in the slums. No doubt, said she. I'll take your word for it but is that any reason why you should neglect the sufferers who live in these marbled palaces? As she spoke, she hooked hold of my arm once more, and in a moment we were climbing the front door steps of a palatial residence. The house showed a dark and forbidding front at that hour in the morning, despite its marble splendors, and I was glad to note that the massive grill doors of wrought iron were heavily barred. "'It's useless, you see. We're locked out,' I ventured. "'Indeed?' she retorted, with a sarcastic smile, as she seized my hand in her icy grip and literally pulled me after her through the marble front of the dwelling. "'What have we to do with bolts and bars?' "'I don't know.' said I ruefully, but I have a notion that if I don't bolt, I'll get the bars all right. I could see them coming, and they were headed straight for me. All you have to do is to follow me, she went on, as we floated upward for two flights, paying but little attention to the treasures of art that lined the walls, and finally passing into a superbly lighted salon, more daintily beautiful than anything of the kind I had ever seen before. "'Jove!' I ejaculated, standing amazed in the presence of such luxury and beauty. I did not realize that with all her treasures New York held anything quite so fine as this. What is it, a music room?' "'It is the nursery,' said my companion. "'Look about you and see for yourself.' I did as I was bidden, and such an array of toys as that inspection revealed. Truly it looked as if the toy market in all sections of the world had been levied upon for tribute. Had all the famous toy emporiums of Nuremberg itself been transported thither bodily, there could not have been playthings in greater variety than there greeted my eye.
from the most insignificant of tin soldiers to the most intricate of mechanical toys for the delectation of the youthful mind, nothing that I could think of was missing. The tin soldiers, as ever, had a fascination for me, and in an instant I was down upon the floor, ranging them in their serried ranks, while the face of my companion wreathed with an indulgent smile. "'You'll do,' said she, as I loaded a little spring cannon with a stub of a lead pencil, and bowled over half a regiment with one well-directed shot. "'These are the finest tin soldiers I ever saw,' I cried with enthusiasm. "'Only they're not tin,' said she. "'Solid silver, every man-jack of them, except the officers. They're made of platinum.' "'And will you look at that little electric railroad?' I cried, my eye ranging to the other end of the salon. "'Stations, switches, danger signals, cars of all kinds, and, and even miniature pullmans, with real little berths that can be let up and down. Who is the lucky kid who's getting all these beautiful things?' "'Shh!' she whispered, putting her finger to her lips. "'He is coming.' Go on and play. Pretend you don't see him until he speaks to you. As she spoke, a door at the far end of the apartment swung gently open, and a little boy tiptoed softly in. He was a golden-haired little chap, and I fell in love with his soft, dreamy eyes the moment my own rested upon them. I could not help glancing up furtively to see his joy over the discovery of all these wondrous possessions. But alas, to my surprise, there was only an unemotional stare in his eyes as they swept the aggregation of childish treasures. Then, on a sudden, he saw me, squatting on the floor, setting up again the army of silver warriors. "'How do you do?' he said gently, but with just a touch of weariness in his sad little voice. "'Good morning, and a Merry Christmas to you, sir,' I replied. "'What are you doing?' he asked, drawing near, and watching me with a great deal of seeming curiosity. "'I am playing with your soldier,' said I. "'I hope you don't mind.' "'Oh, no, indeed,' he replied. "'But what do you mean by that? What is playing?' I could hardly believe my ears. "'What is what?' said I. "'You said you were playing, sir,' said he, "'and I don't know exactly what you mean.' "'Why,' said I, scratching my head hard in a mad quest for a definition, for I couldn't for the life of me think of the answer to his question offhand, any more than I could define one of the elements.' "'Playing is, um, why, it's playing, laddie. Don't you know what it is to play?' "'Oh, yes,' said he. "'It's what you do on the piano. I've been taught to play on the piano, sir.' "'Oh, but this is different,' said I. "'This kind is fun. It's what most little boys do with their toys.' "'You mean breaking them?' said he. No, indeed, said I, it's getting all the fun there is out of them. I think I should like to do that, said he, with a fixed gaze upon the soldiers. Can a little fellow like me learn to play that way? Well, rather, Kitty, said I, reaching out and taking him by the hand. Sit down here on the floor alongside of me, and I'll show you. Oh, no, said he, drawing back. I, I, I can't sit on the floor. I'd catch cold. Now, who under the canopy told you that, I demanded, somewhat impatiently, I fear. My governess and both my nurses, sir, said he. You see, there are drafts. Well, there won't be any drafts this time, said I. Just you sit down here, and we'll have a game of marbles. Ever play marbles with your father? "'No, sir,' he replied. "'He's always too busy, and neither of my nurses has ever known how. "'But your mother comes up here and plays games with you sometimes, doesn't she?' I asked. 
"'Mother is busy, too,' said the child. "'Besides, she wouldn't care for a game which you had to sit on the floor to—' I sprang to my feet and lifted him bodily in my arms, and after squatting him over by the fireplace, where, if there were any draughts at all, they would be as harmless as a summer breeze, I took up a similar position on the other side of the room, and initiated him into the mystery of Miggles as well as I could, considering that all his marbles were real agates. "'You don't happen to have a china alley anywhere, do you?' I asked. "'No, sir,' he answered. "'We only have china plates.' "'Never mind,' I interrupted. "'We can get along very nicely with these.' And then, for half an hour, despite the rich quality of our paraphernalia, that little boy and I indulged in a glorious game of real plebeian migs, and it was a joy to see how quickly his stiff little fingers relaxed and adapted themselves to the uses of his eye, which was as accurate as it was deeply blue. So expert did he become that in a short while he had completely cleaned me out, giving joyous little cries of delight with every hit, and then we turned our attention to the soldiers. "'I want some playing now,' he said gleefully, as I informed him that he had beaten me out of my boots at one of my best games. "'Show me what you were doing with these soldiers when I came in.' "'All right,' said I, obeying with alacrity. First we'll have a parade. I started a great talking machine standing in one corner of the room, off on a spirited military march, and inside of ten minutes, with his assistance, I had all the troops out and to all intents and purposes bravely swinging by to the martial music of Sousa. How's that? said I, when we had got the whole corps arranged to our satisfaction. "'Fine!' he cried, jumping up and down upon the floor, and clapping his hands with glee. "'I've got lots more of these stored away in my toy-closet,' he went on. "'But I never knew that you could do such things as this with them.' "'But what did you think they were for?' I asked. "'Why, uh, just to, um, to keep,' he said hesitatingly. "'Wait a minute,' said I wheeling a couple of cannon off to a distance of a yard from the passing troops. I'll show you something else you can do with them. I loaded both cannon to the muzzle with dried peas and showed him how to shoot. Now, said I, fire. He snapped the spring, and the dried peas flew out like death-dealing shells in war. In a moment the platinum commander of the forces and about thirty-seven solid silver warriors lay flat on their backs. It needed only a little red ink on the carpet to reproduce in miniature a scene of great carnage, but I shall never forget the expression of mingled joy and regret on his countenance as those creatures went down. "'Don't you like it, son?' I asked. "'I don't know, he said, with an anxious glance at the prostrate warriors. They aren't deaded, are they? Oh, of course not, said I, restoring the presumably defunct troopers to life by setting them up again. The only thing that'll dead a soldier like this is to step on him. Try the other gun. Thus reassured, he did as I bade him, and again the proud paraders went down this time amid shouts of glee. And so we passed an all too fleeting two hours, that little boy and I. Through the whole list of his famous toys we went, and as well as I could, I taught him the delicious uses of each and all of them, until finally he seemed to grow weary, and so, drawing up a big armchair before the fire, and taking his tired little body into my lap, with his tousled head cuddled up close over the spot where my heart is alleged to be, I started to read a story to him out of one of the many beautiful books that had been provided for him by his generous parents. But I had not gone far when I saw that his attention was wandering. 
"'Perhaps you'd rather have me tell you a story instead of reading it?' said I. "'What's to tell a story?' he asked, fixing his blue eyes gravely upon mine. "'Great Scott, Kitty,' said I. "'Didn't anybody ever tell you a story?' "'No, sir,' he replied sleepily. "'I get read to every afternoon by my governess, "'but nobody ever told me a story.' "'Well, just you listen to this,' said I, "'giving him a hearty squeeze. "'Once upon a time there was a little boy,' I began, "'and he lived in a beautiful house not far from the park, "'and his daddy—' "'What's a daddy?' asked the child, looking up into my face. "'Why, a daddy is a little boy's father,' I explained. "'You've got a daddy.' "'Oh, yes,' he said. "'If a daddy is a father, I've got one. I saw him yesterday,' he added. "'Oh, did you?' said I. "'And what did he say to you?' "'He said he was glad to see me and hoped I was a good boy,' said the child. He seemed very glad when I told him I hoped so, too, and he gave me all these things here, he and my mother. That was very nice of them, said I huskily. And they're both coming up some time today, or tomorrow, to see if I like them, said the lad. And what are you going to say, I asked, with difficulty getting the words out over a most unaccountable lump that had risen in my throat. I'm going to tell them, he began, as his eyes closed sleepily, that I like them all very, very much. And which one of them all do you like the best, said I. He snuggled up closer in my arms, and raising his little head a trifle higher, he kissed me on the tip end of my chin, and murmured softly as he dropped off to sleep, You. Part three. Good night, said my spectral visitor as she left me, once more bending over my desk, whither I had been retransported without my knowledge, for I must have fallen asleep too with that little boy in my arms. You have done a good night's work. Have I, said I, rubbing my eyes to see if I were really awake, but tell me, who was that little kitty, anyhow? He, she answered with a smile, why, he is the child who has everything but. And then she vanished from my sight. Everything but what? I cried, starting up and peering into the darkness into which she had disappeared. But there was no response, and I was left alone to guess the answer to my question. Section 3. Santa Claus and Little Billy Part 1. He was only a little bit of a chap, and so, when for the first time in his life he came into close contact with the endless current of human things, it was as hard for him to stay put as for some wayward little atom of flotsam and jetsam to keep from tossing about in the surging tides of the sea. His mother had left him there in the big toy shop, with instructions not to move until she came back, while she went off to do some mysterious errand. She thought, no doubt, that with so many beautiful things on every side to delight his eye and hold his attention, strict obedience to her commands would not be hard. But, alas, the good lady reckoned not upon the magnetic power of attraction of all those lovely objects in detail. She saw them only as a mass of wonders which, in all probability, would so dazzle his vision as to leave him incapable of movement. But little Billy was not so indifferent as all that. When a phonograph at the other end of the shop began to rattle off melodious tunes and funny jokes, in spite of the instructions he had received, off he pattered as fast as his little legs would carry him to investigate. After that, forgetful of everything else, 
Finding himself caught in the constantly moving stream of Christmas shoppers, he was borne along in the resistless current until he found himself at last out upon the street, alone, free, and independent. It was great fun at first. By and by, however, the afternoon waned. The sun, as if anxious to hurry along the dawn of Christmas Day, sank early to bed, and the electric lights along the darkening highway began to pop out here and there, like so many merry stars come down to earth to celebrate the gladdest time of all the year. Little Billy began to grow tired, and then he thought of his mamma, and tried to find the shop where he had promised to remain quiet until her return. Up and down the street he wandered, until his little legs grew weary. But there was no sign of the shop, nor of the beloved face he was seeking. Once again, and yet once again after that, did the little fellow traverse that crowded highway, his tears getting harder and harder to keep back, and then, joy of joys, whom should he see walking slowly along the sidewalk but Santa Claus himself? The saint was strangely decorated with two queer-looking boards, with big red letters on them, hung over his back and chest. But there was still that same kindly gray-bearded face, the red cloak with the fur trimmings, and the same dear old cap, that the children's friend had always worn in the pictures of him that little Billy had seen. With a glad cry of happiness, little Billy ran to meet the old fellow, and put his hand gently into that of the saint. He thought it very strange that Santa Claus's hand should be so red and cold and rough, and so chapped. But he was not in any mood to be critical. He had been face to face with a very disagreeable situation. Then, when things had seemed blackest to him, everything had come right again, and he was too glad to take more than passing notice of anything strange and odd. Santa Claus, of course, would recognize him at once, and would know just how to take him back to his mamma at home, wherever that might be. Little Billy had never thought to inquire just where home was. All he knew was that it was a big gray stone house on a long street somewhere, with a tall iron railing in front of it, not far from the park. "'How de do, Mr. Santa Claus,' said Little Billy, as the other's hand unconsciously tightened over his own. "'Why, how de do, Kitty,' replied the old fellow, glancing down at his new-found friend, with surprise gleaming from his deep-set eyes. "'Where did you drop from?' "'Oh, I'm out,' said little Billy bravely. "'My mamma left me a little while ago while she went off about something, and I guess I got losted.' "'Very likely,' returned the old saint with a smile. "'Little two-by-four fellows are apt to get losted when they start in on their own hook.' especially days like these, with such crowds hustling around. But it's all right now, suggested little Billy hopefully. I'm found again, ain't I? Oh, yes, indeedy, you're found all right, Kitty, Santa Claus agreed. And pretty soon you'll take me home again, won't you? said the child. Surest thing you know, answered Santa Claus, looking down upon the bright but tired little face with a comforting smile. "'What might your address be?' "'My what?' asked little Billy. "'Your address,' repeated Santa Claus. "'Where do you live?' The answer was a ringing peal of childish laughter. "'As if you didn't know that!' cried little Billy, giggling. "'Ha!' <laughs> laughed Santa Claus. "'Can't fool you, can I? It would be funny if, after keeping an eye on you all these years since you was a baby, I didn't know where you lived, huh? Awful funny, agreed little Billy. But tell me, Mr. Santa Claus, what sort of a boy do you think I have been? He added, with a shade of anxiety in his voice, Pretty good, pretty good. 
Santa Claus answered, turning in his steps and walking back again along the path he had just traveled, which little Billy thought was rather a strange thing to do. You've got more white marks than black ones, a good many more, a hundred and fifty times as many, Kitty. Fact is, you're all right, way up among the good boys, though once or twice last summer, you know. Yes, I know, said little Billy meekly, but I didn't mean to be naughty. That's just what I said to the bookkeeper, said Santa Claus, and so we gave you a gray mark half white and half black, that doesn't count either way, for or against you. Oh, thank you, sir, said little Billy, much comforted. Don't mention it. You are very welcome, Kitty, said Santa Claus, giving the youngster's hand a gentle squeeze. Why do you call me Kitty, when you know my name is little Billy? asked the boy. Oh, that's what I call all good boys, exclaimed Santa Claus. You see, we divide them up into two kinds, the good boys and the naughty boys, and the good boys we call kiddies, and the naughty boys we call caddies, and there you are. Just then little Billy noticed for the first time the square boards that Santa Claus was wearing. What are you wearing those boards for, Mr. Santa Claus, he asked. If the lad had looked closely enough, he would have seen a very unhappy look come into the old man's face, but there was nothing of it in his answer. "'Oh, those are my new-fangled back and chest protectors, my lad,' he replied. "'Sometimes we have bitter winds blowing at Christmas, and I have to be ready for them. It wouldn't do for Santa Claus to come down with the sneezes at Christmas time, you know. No siree!' This board in front keeps the wind off my chest, and the one behind keeps me from getting rheumatism in my back. They are a great protection against the weather. I'll have to tell my papa about them, said little Billy, much impressed by the simplicity of this arrangement. We have a glass board on the front of our automobile to keep the wind off Henry. He's our chauffeur. But papa wears a fur coat and sometimes he says the wind goes right through that. He'll be glad to know about these boards. I shouldn't wonder, smiled Santa Claus. They aren't very becoming, but they are mighty useful. You might save up your pennies and give your papa a pair like em for his next Christmas. Santa Claus laughed as he spoke, but there was a catch in his voice which little Billy was too young to notice. "'You've got letters printed there,' said the boy, peering around in front of his companion at the lettering on the board. "'What do they spell? You know, I haven't learned to read yet.' "'And why should you know how to read at your age?' said Santa Claus. "'You're not more than five last month,' said little Billy proudly. "'It was such a great age.' "'My, as old as that,' cried Santa Claus. Well, you are growing fast. Why, it don't seem more than yesterday that you was a pink-cheeked baby, and here you are big enough to be out alone. That's more than my little boy is able to do. Santa Claus shivered slightly, and little Billy was surprised to see a tear glistening in his eye. Why, have you got a little boy? he asked. Oh, yes, little Billy, said the saint, a poor white-faced little chap, about a year older than you, who, well, never mind, Kitty, he's a Kitty, too. Let's talk about something else, or I'll have icicles in my eyes. You didn't tell me what those letters on the board spell, said little Billy. Merry Christmas to everybody, said Santa Claus. I have the words printed there so that everybody can see them, and— if I miss wishing anybody a Merry Christmas, he'll know I meant it just the same. You're awfully kind, aren't you? said little Billy, squeezing his friend's hand affectionately. It must make you very happy to be able to be so kind to everybody. Part 2 Santa Claus made no reply to this remark, beyond giving a very deep sigh 
which little Billy chose to believe was evidence of a great inward content. They walked on now in silence, for little Billy was beginning to feel almost too tired to talk and Santa Claus seemed to be thinking of something else. Finally, however, the little fellow spoke. "'I guess I'd like to go home now, Mr. Santa Claus,' he said. "'I'm tired, and I'm afraid my mamma will be wondering where I've gone to.' "'That's so, my little man,' said Santa Claus, stopping short in his walk up and down the block. "'Your mother will be worried, for a fact, and your father, too.' I know how I'd feel if my little boy got losted and hadn't come home at dinner time. I don't believe you know where you live, though. Now, honest. Come, fess up, Billy. You don't know where you live, do you? Why, yes, I do, said little Billy. It's in the big gray stone house with the iron fence in front of it, near the park. Oh, that's easy enough, laughed Santa Claus nervously. Anybody could say he lived in a gray stone house with a fence around it near the park, but you don't know what street it's on, nor the number, either. I'll bet fourteen wooden giraffes against a monkey on a stick. No, I don't, said little Billy, frankly, but I know the number of our automobile. It's N.Y. Fine, laughed Santa Claus. If you really were lost, it would be a great help to know that. But not being lost, as you ain't, why, of course, we can get along without it. It's queer you don't know your last name, though. I do, too, know my last name, blurted out little Billy. It's Billy. That's the last one they gave me, anyhow. Santa Claus reflected for a moment, eyeing the child anxiously. "'I don't believe you even know your papa's name,' he said. "'Yes, I do,' said little Billy indignantly. "'His name is Mr. Harrison.' "'Well, you are a smart little chap,' cried Santa Claus gleefully. "'You got it right the very first time, didn't you?' "'I really didn't think you knew. "'But I don't believe you know where your papa keeps his bake-shop, "'where he makes all those nice cakes and cookies you eat.' Billy began to laugh again. "'You can't fool me, Mr. Santa Claus,' he said. "'I know my papa don't keep a bake-shop just as well as you do. My papa owns a bank.' "'Splendid! Made of tin, I suppose, with a nice little hole at the top to drop pennies into,' said Santa Claus. "'No, it ain't, either,' retorted little Billy. It's made of stone, and has more than a million windows in it. I went down there with my mamma to Papa's office the other day, so I guess I ought to know. Well, I should say so, said Santa Claus. Nobody better. By the way, Billy, what does your mamma call your Papa? Billy, like you, he added. Oh, no, indeed, returned little Billy. She calls him Papa, except once in a while when he's going away, and then she says, "Goodbye, Tom. Fine again, said Santa Claus, blowing upon his fingers, for now that the sun had completely disappeared over in the west, it was getting very cold. Thomas Harrison, banker, he muttered to himself. What with a telephone book and the city directory, I guess we can find our way home with little Billy. "'Do you think we can go now, Mr. Santa Claus?' asked little Billy, for the cold was beginning to cut through his little coat, and the sandman had started to scatter the sleepy seeds all around. "'Yes, sir-ree,' returned Santa Claus promptly. "'Right away, off now, instantly, at once. I'm afraid I can't get my reindeer here in time to take us up to the house, but we can go in the cars. Hmm.' I don't know whether we can or not, come to think of it. Ah, do you happen to have ten cents in your pocket? Santa added with an embarrassed air. You see, I, I've left my pocketbook in the sleigh with my toy pack, and besides, mine is only toy money, and they don't take that on the cars. I got twenty-five cents, 
said little Billy proudly, as he dug his way down into his pocket and brought the shining silver piece to light. You can have it if you want it. Thank you, said Santa Claus, taking the proffered coin. We'll start home right away. Only come in here first while I telephone to Santaville, telling the folks where I am. He led the little fellow into a public telephone station, where he eagerly scanned the names in the book. At last it was found. Thomas Harrison, 7654 Plaza. And then, in the seclusion of the telephone booth, Santa Claus sent the gladdest of all Christmas messages over the wire to two distracted parents. I have found your little boy wandering in the street. He is safe, and I will bring him home right away. Part 3 Fifteen minutes later there might have been seen the strange spectacle of a footsore Santa Claus leading a sleepy little boy up Fifth Avenue to a cross street, which shall be nameless. The boy vainly endeavored to persuade his companion to come in and meet Mama. No, Billy, the old man replied sadly, I must hurry back. You see, Kitty, this is my busy day. Besides, I never go into a house except through the chimney. I wouldn't know how to behave going in at a front door. But it was not to be as Santa Claus willed, for little Billy's papa and his mamma and his brothers and sisters and the butler and the housemaids and two or three policemen were waiting at the front door when they arrived. Aha! said one of the policemen, seizing Santa Claus roughly by the arm. We've landed you all right. Where have you been with this boy? You let him alone, cried little Billy, with more courage than he had ever expected to show in the presence of a policeman. He's a friend of mine. That's right, officer, said little Billy's father. Let him alone. I haven't entered any complaint against this man. But you want to look out for these fellers, Mr. Harrison, returned the officer. First thing you know, they'll be making a trade of this sort of thing. I'm no grafter, retorted Santa Claus indignantly. I found the little chap wandering along the street, and as soon as I was able to locate where he lived, I brought him home. That's all there is to it. He knew where I lived all along, laughed little Billy. Only he pretended he didn't, just to see if I knew. You see, sir, said the officer, it won't do him any harm to let him cool his heels. It is far better that he should warm them, officer, said Mr. Harrison kindly, and he can do that here. Come in, my man, he added, turning to Santa Claus with a grateful smile, just for a minute anyhow. Mrs. Harrison will wish to thank you for bringing our boy back to us. We have had a terrible afternoon. That's all right, sir, said Santa Claus modestly. It wasn't anything, sir. I didn't really find him. It was him as found me, sir. He took me for the real thing, I guess. Nevertheless, Santa Claus, led by little Billy's persistent father, went into the house. Now that the boy could see him in the full glare of many electric lights, his furs did not seem the most gorgeous things in the world. When the flapping front of his red jacket flew open, the child was surprised to see how ragged was the thin gray coat it covered, and, as for the good old saint's comfortable stomach, strange to say, it was not. I, uh, I, I wish you all a Merry Christmas, faltered Santa Claus, but I really must be going, sir. Nonsense, cried Mr. Harrison, not until you have got rid of this chill, and— I can't stay, sir, said Santa. I'll lose my job if I do. Well, what if you do? I'll give you a better one, said the banker. I, I can't, I, I can't, faltered the man. I, I, I've i got a little billy of my own at home waiting for me, sir. If I hadn't, he added fiercely, do you suppose I'd be doing this? He pointed at the painted boards and shuddered. It's him as has kept me from, from the river, he muttered hoarsely, 
and then this dispenser of happiness to so many millions of people all the world over sank into a chair, and covering his face with his hands, wept like a child. "'I guess Santa Claus is tired, Papa,' said little Billy, snuggling up closely to the old fellow, and taking hold of his hand sympathetically. "'He's been walking a lot today.' "'Yes, my son,' said Mr. Harrison gravely. "'These are very busy times for Santa Claus, "'and I guess that, as he still has a hard night ahead of him, "'James had better ring up Henry "'and tell him to bring the car around right away "'so that we may take him back to uh, his little boy. "'We'll have to lend him a fur coat to keep the wind off, too, "'for it is a bitter night.' "'Oh,' said little Billy, I haven't told you about these boards he wears. He has em to keep the wind off, and they're fine, Papa, little Billy pointed to the two signboards which Santa Claus had leaned up against the wall. He says he uses em on cold nights, the lad went on. They have writing on them, too. Do you know what it says? Yes, said Mr. Harrison, glancing at the boards. It says, If you want a good Christmas dinner for a quarter— "'Go to Smithers' Café.' "'Little Billy roared with laughter. "'Papa, you're trying to fool me, "'just as you did when you pretended "'not to know where I lived, Santa Claus,' he said, "'looking up into the old fellow's face, "'his own countenance brimming over with mirth. "'You mustn't think he can't read, though,' "'the lad added hastily. "'He's only joking.' "'Oh, no, indeed.' "'I shouldn't have thought that,' replied Santa Claus, smiling through his tears. "'I've been joking, have I?' said little Billy's papa. Uh, "'Well, then, Mr. Billiam, suppose you inform me what it says on those boards.' "'Merry Christmas to everybody,' said little Billy proudly. "'I couldn't read it myself, but he told me what it said.' He has it printed there so that if he misses saying it to anybody, they'll know he means it just the same. "'By Jove, Mr. Santa Claus,' cried little Billy's papa, grasping the old man warmly by the hand, "'I owe you ten million apologies. I haven't believed in you for many a long year, but now, sir, I take it all back. You do exist, and by the great horn spoon—' You are the real thing. Part 4 Little Billy had the satisfaction of acting as host to Santa Claus at a good, luscious dinner, which Santa Claus must have enjoyed very much, because, when explaining why he was so hungry, it came out that the poor old chap had been so busy all day that he had not had time to get any lunch. No, not even one of those good dinners at Smithers Café, to which little Billy's father had jokingly referred. And after dinner, Henry came with the automobile, and bidding everybody good night, Santa Claus and little Billy's papa went out of the house together. Christmas morning dawned, and little Billy awoke from wonderful dreams of rich gifts and of extraordinary adventures with his new-found friend, to find the reality quite as splendid as the dream things. Later, what was his delight when a little boy, not much older than himself, a pale, thin, but playful little fellow, arrived at the house to spend the day with him, bringing with him a letter from Santa Claus himself. This was what the letter said. Dear little Billy, you must not tell anybody except your papa and your mamma, but the little boy who brings you this letter is my little boy, and I am going to let you have him for a playfellow for Christmas Day. Treat him kindly for his papa's sake, and if you think his papa is worth loving, tell him so. Do not forget me, little Billy. I shall see you often in the future, but I doubt if you will see me. I am not going to return to 23rd Street again, but shall continue my work in the land of Yule, in the palace of goodwill, whose beautiful windows look out upon the homes of all good children. Good-bye, little Billy, 
and the happiest of happy Christmases to you and all of yours. Affectionately, Santa Claus. When little Billy's mamma read this to him that Christmas morning, a stray little tear ran down her cheek and fell upon little Billy's hand. Why, what are you crying for, mamma? he asked. With happiness, my dear little son, his mother answered. I was afraid yesterday that I might have lost my little boy forever, but now— You have an extra one thrown in for Christmas, haven't you? said little Billy, taking his new playmate by the hand. The visitor smiled back at him with a smile so sweet that anybody might have guessed that he was the son of Santa Claus. As for the latter, little Billy has not seen him again, but down at his father's bank there is a new messenger named John who has a voice so like Santa Claus's voice that whenever little Billy goes down there in the motor to ride home at night with his papa, he runs into the bank and has a long talk with him, just for the pleasure of pretending that it is Santa Claus he is talking to. Indeed, the voice is so like that once a sudden and strange idea flashed across little Billy's mind. "'Have you ever been on 23rd Street, John?' he asked. "'23rd Street?' replied the messenger, scratching his head as if very much puzzled. "'What's that?' "'Why, it's a street.' said little Billy, rather vaguely. "'Well, to tell you the truth, Billy,' said John, "'I've heard tell of 23rd Street, and they say it is a very beautiful and interesting spot. But, you know, I don't get much chance to travel. I've been too busy all my life to go abroad.' "'Abroad!' roared little Billy, grinning at John's utterly absurd mistake. "'Why, 23rd Street ain't abroad!' It's uptown, near, oh, near, um, um, Twenty-second Street. Really, returned John, evidently tremendously surprised. Well, 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 who'd have thought of that? Well, if that's the case, some time when I get a week off, I'll have to go and spend my vacation there. From which little Billy concluded that his suspicion that John might be Santa Claus in disguise was entirely without foundation in fact. I hope you like these stories. Sentimental stories, sure, but still a lot of fun. We will have more for you tomorrow and every day up to and including Christmas. The 12 Days of Craft Lit are brought to you by our wonderful patrons at patreon.com. And some of those patrons we will be able to see in person with you if you choose to go on our tour to Scotland. The Craftlet 2018 June tour is filling up. Final payment is due March 15th, but between now and then, all you have to do is call and leave a $200 deposit, and that will reserve you your space. You can find out everything you need to know by either going to craftlet.com and clicking on the picture icon. It's got Highland cows in it. In the right-hand sidebar, or you can call 1-800-826-2266 and speak to Diane. And if you're really good this year, maybe someone will give you the trip as your Christmas present. All right, craftlit.com slash first dash 2017, F-I-R-S-T dash 2017. Happy Hanukkah if you're of the tribe. Happy holidays if you're feeling generic, and have a merry time as we lead up to Christmas Day. We'll have the 12 Days of Craft Lit play you out. Here we go.